All right, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks very much, Lindy, and, and welcome everyone to this breakout session on binaries and multi-national science. Um, it's a topic covered by a number of the science working groups um, and indeed on the mind of some of the technical working groups um, within EHD and NGHT. Um, so we've got five talks. Each of them is 10 minutes and we're gonna allow ten, uh, two minutes for questions. Um, I think I'll give speakers a heads up after seven minutes. So with one minute of their speaking time left so that we keep two minutes for talk for, for questions. Please raise your hand. Um, and keep yourself muted and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. Otherwise, just pop your question in the chat. And then I'll ask that once a talk is finished and questions to that talk completed, please move the chat over to the dedicated uh, Slack channel. Right, so with housekeeping done, um, please let's proceed uh, with a, a very interesting talk from Yong Fan on, from the Kavli Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, uh, Peking University, imaging binary black holes with the LBI using time varying uh, visibility. So let me stop my share and let you take the take the control over to you. Yeah. Uh, could you see my um, slider? They're not in full screen mode, but we can see and hear you. Okay. Um, there we go. Great. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Yuen from. from uh, I'm a postdoc from the Kaplan Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at Peking University. And today I'm glad to be here to introduce you our recent work on the study of uh, orbital tomography of a binary supermassive by holes very, very, uh, with very long baseline in the forometry. And uh, I'd like to thank for. Uh, the collaboration with Yang, uh, Huan Yang from the Primitive Institute for uh, Theoretical Physics. Oh, sorry, it was. Uh, oh, okay. A uh, supermassive hole battery could form uh, as a consequence of uh, gas modules at the earlier stage of their evolution. Uh, dynamical fraction uh, uh, will migrate the battery to. Uh, plastic separation and the gravitational wave emission is e efficient at taking away the energy and the angle momentum of the binary at uh, subplastic separations. And uh, the gravitational wave emission at this stage is important for post timing array. There arise the uh, fellow plastic problem about this separation, uh, separation gap. Uh, astrophysical observation of a supermassive hole battery at a subplastic separation is important for this problem. Currently, supermassive hole uh, um, battery are found by electromagnetic image and identified as a uh, double galaxy nu uh, nuclei. Uh, super, and supermassive hole uh, battery candidates are found indirectly by the same periodic or DCT uh, um, variation, such as the semi periodic uh, net curves just shows in this uh, lower uh, figure. And the emission line dynamics uh, tidal disruption events, etc. Since we have uh, these observations, one could uh, one may ask um, why the uh, we could uh, observe supermassive by hole battery at the subplastic separation uh, due to the orbital motion of an unresolved radial core uh, with VLBI, uh, such as the NGHT. Um, the topic of this uh, conference, uh, we focus on the radial band of the image of supermassive hole binary described by point-like luminosity with the two point uh, to delta function. And the variability function is just the floral uh, transform of the image. Uh, we focus on the amplitude of the variability function, which is related to the relative separate uh, to the projected uh, uh, um, vector of the, the binary separation. And the dot with the baseline uh, gives this uh, phase uh, function we denote as the phi here. It encodes the information of uh, orbital parameters, including the eccentricity, same major axis divided by angular diameter distance and the orbital angles, etc. 
to recover the orbital parameters of the supermassive black hole boundary. The key is to fit the variability data measured by different baselines. Uh, we estimate the orbital parameter, uh, parameters of supermassive black hole boundary um, by doing numerical simulations. Um, and you may find a mathematical proof of uh, uh, recovering the orbital parameters in the appendix of our paper for uh, assuming uh, perfect detections. Um, the simulation, uh, the numerical simulation start with the likelihood function of the uh, amplitude of the variability uh, uh, function in this expression. And we consider three examples of supermassive black hole batteries um, um, uh, configured in this table. Uh, they have orbital periods of 10, uh, 50, and 20 years, respectively. They set, uh, the source are set at the one gigapascal distance and uh, uh, with um, uh, 50 and uh, 30 um, mini gen sky of the uh, individual in, uh, intensities. And this figure shows the time varying of the variability of, for this three uh, examples, um, uh, assuming uh, observation by two or normal baselines um, and the 10 years uh, um, uh, ev uh, evolution. Um, uh, here in this uh, figure, uh, it shows the uh, two-dimensional uh, posterior, um, um, posterior distribution of uh, uh, the parameters uh, of the orbital parameters of supermassive black hole binaries uh, for, uh, for our three examples. Um, um, the results are conducted uh, by uh, using Monte Carlo uh, uh, Markov simulations. And uh, um, here um, are totally uh, nine unknown parameters in our image uh, model. Uh, if you see detailly uh, with your eyes open, <laughs> here is eccentricity uh, ratio of um, semi major axis divided by angular diameter distance, uh, the orbital frequency, the uh, to inf intensity of the individuals um, and the inclination um, on a parapsis, longitudinal ascending node, and alicia phase. Uh, so it, uh, the results show that uh, the uh, uh, orbital parameters for supermassive by how battery could properly recover it um, by using uh, this um, um, simulations. And here, this figure shows the results of the posterior distribution for uh, orbital parameters, uh, assuming different uh, detection conditions and the different configurations of supermassive black hole binaries. Here, the first comb uh, is just the result of our second example in this figure. And the, se the second comb is the result assuming a uh, different error bar model. And importantly, in the uh, third column, we assume uh, um, four baselines compared to the uh, uh, first column uh, with two baselines. The, the constraining, the, the, the results of the constraining are uh, significantly improved with four baselines. And the first column is the result of, of a four, ba four baseline, but uh, only half of the observation times compared to the uh, third clone. The last uh, um, two clones are uh, the uh, lower and the upper detection limits on the um, binary separations um, and showed in uh, this uh, separate, uh, angular separations. We also um, discuss the astrophysical applications um, um, uh, of uh, multi messenger and the multi band detections. Uh, if we assume pulsar timing array, we uh, will detect the, the gravitational waves of uh, supermassive black hole batteries up to an uh, SNR. And uh, combined with the image detection by NGHT, we could recover the chip mice and the total mice of the battery and then 
uh, recover the individual masses, just as you see in these two examples, assuming uh, different uh, um, mass ratios. And in the multiband um, case, um, if one could detect the optical band land curve um, due to the relativity Lorentz um, both on the uh, mm, uh, flux intensity and combined with the image detection by, uh, by HUT, we could resolve the orbital parameters and then the individual velocity. And similarly, we could recover the individual uh, masses and uh, we could have, we, if we further assuming simultaneously detect the two, uh, the, the land curves of the two individuals and, the, and then the, uh, uh, this two velocity, we could have uh, um, further uh, recover the same major axis and then the angular diameter distance and finally determine Hubble constant independently. That's uh, here one minute um, uh, if you want to uh, know more details of our uh, work, uh, you are welcome to uh, refer to this archive paper I shown here. Uh, I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you for your listening. Great, thank you very much Yun, for the talk. Uh, questions? I see hands up. Um, I'm not sure who was first between Rowan and Lindy. Please. Uh, one of you take the honors. Okay, sure, I'll go. Um, thank you, Yun. This is really great work. Um, and I appreciate the actual work uh, uh, trying to reconstruct the parameters of the system. I was wondering if, the, did you have a, uh, did you place a, like a likely candidate range? And what do you think is the most probable um, multi-messenger system, like whether the mass, mass ratio, redshift, uh, do you have any any parameters of a likely event that would be observed? Uh, you mean the optical uh, optimal um, parameters for mass ratio or a redshift for detection? Yeah, I, I mean, I realize everything's a, a, a population mm -hmm. dependent thing, but what do you think is a plausible uh, set of parameters that that we might observe in coincidence with either oh, gravitation waves? We, or, in this or example, or... So we assume the um, Binary supermassive bell holes are set as a redshift of 0.23. And uh, the, 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 whether we could uh, 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 recover the orbital parameters, it, uh, uh, it is important it dependent on the uh, uh, two in the, uh, two intensity of the two individuals because um, uh, and, and this individual uh, uh, intensity is related to uh, mass of the uh, components. And it's, it is not directly related to the mass ratio uh, for uh, image detection. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, all right, uh, Roman, I, I, sorry. Uh, could we perhaps take your, we're a touch over time. So perhaps you could take that to the Slack channel, but uh, let's let's thank you again for a lovely talk. And Akash, can you please line up your, your slides for the next talk? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is Akash in the room? Um, no, it doesn't appear to be unless I'm missing. Um, so Neil, there you are. Are you yeah. ready to step in? Okay, okay great. Thanks I very can, much. And hopefully, hopefully Akash can, uh, can join us a bit later. Um, so, so Neil's going to be talking about potential for resolved imaging of gravitational wave emitting supermassive black hole binaries with the NGHT. Take it away. Yep. Thanks very much. So I'm here really to present on behalf of Venkatesh Ramakrishnan and our new master student Vicente Aratia at UDEC. Um, I should also mention work by Belisha Bandapadhyay, um, postdoc here, Danya Naya, who will join us soon. And next week or this week, we'll advertise for two new postdocs. So it's really plus a lot of EHT and NGHT collaborators. I won't name them here, but it's basically looking for very putting names to binary SMBH targets. So basically, this is part of what we call the ether sample. Uh, the event horizon and environs 
sample, which is for the EHT, the NGHT, and all future generations, it's science agnostic. It's hopefully hundreds to uh, thousands of, of, of parent targets from which you can cherry pick for your own science goals, be it shadows, jet bases, gravitational wave emitters. Uh, so specifically to concentrate on the gravitational wave emitters, right now there are about 400 candidates that we that are out in the literature. These could be from centimeter VLBI imaging where you see both cores, where you only see one core, uh, from jet precession, uh, radio jet precession, from double kinematic components in the X-ray or the optical, and a lot of them from QSO periodic variability. But it's important also to be flexible for the future because uh, LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to come online very soon. It's going to give us a huge number of periodic variables. Uh, there's also the PTA in the near-term future and ELISA in the long-term future. So what we're doing effectively is we start with a base of black hole masses. This helps us a lot. Currently about 550K, uh, 550,000 black hole mass estimates because only about 200 are measurements. These come from all kinds of typical estimations from Sigma, from L-Bulge, single epoch reverberation mapping, fundamental planes. I should specifically mention half a million actually come from the SDSS, single epoch reverberation mapping. And black hole mapper of SDSS-5 is going to add a huge number of these, especially for the Erosita sources. So what we really need is EHT, uh, EHT flux estimates. And here's a, a set of M87, so nu versus L nu. You see the ADAF, the accretion inflow, and you see the jet base. This is all within the innermost 100 Swatchell radii. And what we're looking for is what's the flux here at 230 gigahertz or roughly 345 or 230. You can come in from the left, choose very powerful centimeter wave VLBI sources and see how they do at 230 gigahertz. This is a lot of what uh, effectively, oops, uh, what uh, Venki is leading. Uh, it's not just choosing these sources, but then pushing them to higher frequencies to make sure that they're EHT detectable. This is one way to look at it. The size of the ring versus the EHT estimated flux from high frequency VLBI. And you see, you know, there are two loners out here, Sajay Stan M87, as you know, but there are several others who at this point, maybe with super resolution techniques, we could image the jet, the, the jet base and the black hole ring. And in fact, the first eight of these are already on the HT plus ALMA schedule for next uh, month. So this is well, well advanced. But the other way to do it is, oh, this is another way to look at it. And more importantly, for gravitational wave emitters, you look at the same sources. They're very few because this is just the centimeter wave VLBI extrapolated and taken to higher and higher frequencies by us. As you see, the whole universe is sub 0.2 milliparts, 0.2 parsec, right? So here are all the sources. I've started at a millijansky, which may be a push, but you can think of it as 10 millijanskys and above. We have a lot of sources here, right? Uh, but what about directly from the center? We have many large rings, which you can see here in green, y-axis arbitrary, many large rings, which we don't know their real flux at milli arc second scales. We're following this up with ALMA. We're getting the first, the first 50 have been scheduled in ALMA. The first 10 are out. And we're slowly filling up fluxes because we could get some things here for the NGHT. If they're 20 millijanskys, they might not be detected in the centimeter wave because remember, they could be radio quiet, but they're really much stronger in the millimeter. But really what I want to talk about today is how to get millions. Well, a million sources could come in, but maybe we'll end up with 10 to 100,000. You take a hex, hard X-ray flux and you take an ADAF model and can you predict the flux and does it work? And that's really today. So these are basically analytic ADAP models from Pesce et al, very recently published. Synchrotron, Compton, and Bremsstrahlung emission from the accretion inflow all added together. What you need is a black hole mass and an accretion rate. Here's M87 with different accretion rates. You see it changes very much. Here's Sag A star with different accretion rates. Always the set changing very much. 230 gigahertz is around here and hard X-rays around here. So we are running these against models. Here's M87. If you just fit this very simple, uh, sorry, we're running it against very detailed ADAF models, which are actually integrated on one dimensional space from, in this case, for example, from Bidisha Bandopadhyay, and we get good fits. Of course, we have to add a jet component. Uh, you see this is non-normalization because when you add a jet, you actually boost the flux in the X-ray comes from the jet and the accretion flow. We figure this out, we have parametric jet models and we are correcting for that. So just some examples, you know, with or without 4278, Without, you could predict a certain flux from the hard X-ray. Uh, with, you have to compensate for the jet. In other cases, 3998, with or without the jet doesn't really matter. You can kind of predict a 230 gigahertz flux. Does it work? Yes, because these have 230 gigahertz fluxes observed and it kind of comes out okay. You can look at radio quiet sources, some very interesting ones. 1600 has a very large ring, 27 micro arc seconds, but it's less than a millijansky. This prediction tells you that it should be about 72 millijanskis. So, well, you know, we're not doing it very well in some cases. 6861, also a large ring, eight 
micro arc seconds. It, uh, actual observations say 30 millijanskis, this predicts 64. So within factor of five, we're kind of doing well with the radio quiet uh, AGMs. To take very specific, now these are just teasers because we're very much in progress, very specific examples. Here's a, uh, a binary SMBH, 0402 plus 379, uh, basically a 7.3 parsec. So not a gravitational wave emitter really. Two cores, about 23 8 millijanskis at 43 gigahertz with the VLBA. You kind of stick their red shifts and their frequencies and fluxes and take a, an arbitrary black hole uh, mass distribution between them. If they're equal black hole masses, you're down to about 10 millijanskis at 230 gigahertz, according to this. And if you have an unequal, maybe you're up to about 40 millijanskis. Another example, which is not as promising, 76, uh, 74. Again, two cores, potentially a binary, this time at 0.35 parsec separation. So you go through the same thing. And here, of course, they're very weak at centimeter, but even the accretion inflow, remember the centimeter is the jet. So you can't just extrapolate, but in the ADAF accretion inflow is also sub millijansky. So these are all teasers because we are very much in progress. Uh, what we've got to is, you know, we've got about 8,000 fluxes right now. We have a distribution, they are unfortunately weak. We're talking about one to 10 millijansky primarily. So we can add thousands of sources to these plots that I showed you before. I don't want to add them right now because we are still understanding the systematics. But these sources will come in here, and that's just a few, right? So I had a thousand sources, so what? The point is that Erosita is gonna give us early next year, sometime next year, a million hard X-ray fluxes. Black hole mapper will follow these up, is already following this up to give us black hole masses. So we can now mass produce this and really fill this up with, you know, maybe a hundred thousand galaxies. Uh, specifically targeting also very specific gravitational wave emitting candidates, all of these QSOs, Again, I would mention many of their fluxes come out sub millijansky and we can throw them away, but a reasonable number might just work out for the NGHT. So effectively, uh, we, we need to produce this. We keep promising it. Uh, Ether 1 will just be the top 100 sources for the EHT, uh, which Venki is leading. Ether 2 is uh, master student Vicente Aratia who will be leading it, where here we'll just give you the full database sample, plus some of these interactive models, hopefully. So you could kind of twiddle X-ray fluxes, twiddle black hole mass ratios, in known sources. And we, we could do this modeling for you and give you an idea of what fluxes you could estimate. Of course, all of these will have to go to, these are estimates. Uh, they'll all, we could presumably go in which we're already doing. We go to ALMA at 50 milli arc second resolution, confirm its flux, and then do a free EHT fringe test. So the idea to leave you with, that's the end. The idea to leave you with is that there is a reasonable source population that we can look for. If we're talking about a millijansky flux limit, not only in RMS noise, but you know, detectability because of phasing over from, from a strong nearby calibrator. Um, if we go up higher, I'm not quite sure how it'll work out. Great, thank you very much, Neil. Some exciting expansion of the, the target list of EHT in the future. Questions and round of applause, of course. I don't see any hands, but I will ask in terms of survey strategy, you're obviously, uh, you've got the fainter sources or fainter candidates, shall we say, um, and the possibilities um, of subarraying. Have you thought about observing strategies in that context? So we're, this is a very good point. May, maybe we, uh, at this point, we've kind of left it for later because these the first observations of what we call passive phasing at ALMA will be in March, 2021. And we're gonna to have to see how it works because you know, even if the, and we were talking about this in the Lego block session today, uh, even if NGHT specifies a 0.1 millijansky um, thermal RMS on a baseline, you'd imagine a 10 sigma detection of a one millijansky source. But if your phase transfer doesn't work, maybe the true limit is 70. Uh, and this will in some sense guide a lot of our subarraying and our fringe test, uh, uh, tests for the future. Will we always need that ALMA baseline or can we do something else? So I think this is very, very important to, to figure out. Uh, Jose and, and Priya and the others also mentioned it will be important to try to run simulations. So I'm afraid we haven't done it yet, but we really should. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we're certainly encouraging um, the capabilities of ALMA, um, subarraying envision, envisioned in the future that Sean, was, Sean Doherty was outlining yesterday, um, especially for these, this kind of survey activity. Um, are there any questions for Neil? If not, then let's say thank you very much and thanks for stepping up uh, uh, earlier than you were anticipating.
Appreciate it. All right, uh, next up we have Roman Gold uh, talking about gravitational wave driven binary supermassive black holes as NGEHD targets. All yours, Roman. There we go. Finally, unmuted myself, which is useful when you give a talk. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll talk about the gravitational wave driven binary supermassive black holes. Uh, um, yeah, in addition to what we've heard already, uh, it's a great session. Um, you've seen this slide before. Um, I've emphasized that these are very fascinating objects to study, both theoretically and, and observationally. Uh, and I want to build on the previous talks, uh, which have been uh, great um, introductions to this. Uh, and just add a little bit. Um, so I won't go through this again if you've heard me talk about it on, on, on Monday, uh, but just I'm trying to emphasize that that is really important that we go from the modeling side along at least two different routes where we um, use a very simple approach, um, keeping, you know, focusing on, on the orbit and, and keeping the image structure relatively simple so that we can go after it with uh, powerful uh, parameter estimation tools. Um, so things like orbiting Gaussians and, and point sources and so on. Um, and, uh, and also at the same time going at it with a bit more, you know, of a, of a challenge with physical models with GRMHD simulations like, like we're doing it for, for single black hole uh, binaries. Um, and um, I, will, I will go over a few things that, that I think are, are the next step in um, taking into account some of the astrophysical context that these sources uh, will naturally be living in and what that means for the, for the NGEHT. Um, and you can, you can see on the, uh, on the right here that, um, that the, there's a very clear signature uh, um, that, that binaries, of course, impart on the visibility domain. And we can use a VLB IRA very naturally, as we've seen in, in, uh, in Yun's talk in particular uh, today, um, using VLBI monitoring to, to pick this up and, um, and hopefully identify uh, a binary uh, and, and distinguish it from, from something else. All right, so um, so the signature, the VLBI signature of two point sources or two Gaussians is, is extremely simple, of course, um, but things don't always go uh, by the textbook. Um, I've, I've studied accreting supermassive black holes in dynamic space time, theoretically, from, you know, with GRMHD simulations since 2011. And one thing I've learned is that they're very messy and complicated objects, uh, which is uh, illustrated by, by these three snapshots that I picked from a uh, from one of my publications on this topic. Um, so what I'm trying to get to is that um, while uh, simplicity is fantastic, um, we, we, might, we might want to consider the possibility that, that if we stare at real sources, um, that, that we might see more than just the textbook, uh, you know, uh, visibility structure of two separated point sources. And if we ignore this, um, then we run into the danger of uh, either uh, not, not detecting it in the first place because of model misspecification, uh, or we are, we're biasing uh, our inferred parameters, uh, both of which uh, could potentially lead to uh, problems. So the question is then, uh, how, how, can we, how can we deal with this? Uh, so Avery Broderick, who's on the call, will recognize this slide, um, which, I, which I shamelessly stole. Um, one thing we can do is um, we can combine imaging techniques with uh, uh, modeling techniques. Uh, and this is also very powerful, uh, not only for the cases that we uh, envision first, um, but it's, it can also be very important uh, for this particular topic. The idea is that you combine standard image reconstruction tools uh, that, that were in use in VLBI for a long time with modeling, which was also in use for a long time and, and put them on the same footing, basically. And that allows you in this context to model the, the binary in the visibility domain uh, while still allowing for more complicated structure in the image that you don't understand or that you don't know how to interpret, but you can accommodate it in the uh, in the data, and that can uh, that can reduce um, biases, for example, in in your inferred parameters and make your detection more robust. Um, and and there's a, there's a number of uh, advantages, but I have to speed up a little bit. <laughs> All right, here's a here's an example of the application that. We're first thinking about, uh, of course, which is pulling rings out of stuff, you know. And so uh, this is a case of simulated data. And, and you can see here, if you image this and add a ring to it and flipping back and forth between those, that the inference is, uh, is really good in this case. All right, um, moving on to these more complicated cases. Um, how, much, how much time do I have, Roger? Sorry, I lost track. 
Um, anyway, I'll just put sorry, it on. Sorry, you, you've got plenty. You've got okay. a good idea. Great, perfect. So um, GRMHD simulations uh, are uh, not only not only complicated of these systems, but they, they were also uh, very, very expensive. And the reason is that um, we're not dealing with a Kerr metric or a superposition of Kerr metrics or something like that. We are dealing with a dynamic space time that in general, uh, up until now, uh, had to be solved with um, uh, numerical relativity tools where you really solve Einstein's field equations uh, and you don't get away with assuming a fixed uh, metric. And so now we found a very uh, computational, computationally efficient setup where we are taking very specific forms of initial data um, that are normally used by numerical relativity codes to evolve the space time and compute gravitational waves. Uh, here we use them and, uh, and use the fact that there is a helical symmetry um, if you are in a regime that the NGEHT uh, will be in for many sources. And then you can, you can transform in the co-rotating frame of the binary. And in that frame, the metric will be stationary, will not depend on time. And that has the enormous advantage that you can use a, a stationary space-time code, like the ones we've been using in the EHT all the time, uh, to simulate binaries. It requires, of course, some code development. Um, but with my collaborators, Hector Olivares and Samuel Tudor, uh, we've been making a lot of uh, progress on this. And here you can see uh, one of the uh, example simulations um, uh, that, that it works beautifully uh, and we're using these adaptive grids and the code is much more efficient. It's, it, it scales better and so on. It has uh, more accuracy um, and the, and the space-time metric is also much more accurate than in numerical relativity simulations. The other advantage, the obvious one, is that if you're using a code that's already used in the EHT, it's already interfaced with a number of other things like the uh, radiative transfer codes, ray tracing, and so on. Um, so we, we know how to, how to connect this to what we actually measure, which is a great advantage. So here's a first example of, uh, of some of the lower resolution runs that, that we've been doing and we're, we're building up as we go. Uh, and you can see, despite this is a stationary space-time code, it, it's perfectly able to, to handle the, the binary dynamics. You see the magnetization in the upper panel side-on view and a, uh, and a, top, a top view uh, on, on the density of the system. All right, uh, this is uh, all I had, uh, just an outlook at the end. Um, so the, the ray tracing code BOSS in particular is already capable of handling binary space times. And, and here's, a, here's, a, here's an image that, that Ziri Yunzi uh, shared with me um, that, that demonstrates, uh, here's a background image, uh, of course, it's not a simulation, um, but it shows you that, that um, the code can handle binary space times and the goal is to to, uh, to interface that, it is already interfaced, but um, to produce these models uh, in a very realistic uh, fashion. So here are a couple of literature, um, including a reference to, to Yun's paper um, that, I, that I invite you to look at. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Roman. Questions for Roman? Uh, I see a hand up. Hi, Roman. Very nice talk. Um, so you are talking about space, uh, stationary space time, right? So which means you are ignoring the effects of gravitational wave emission. Uh, can you pull that one sort of, uh, you know, uh, as a module into this? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we, we are ignoring gravitational wave emission here. That is true. Um, if you're in the right regime, that's a, that's a good approximation to take. Um, okay. We can, of course, as you, as you know, we, we can still predict the gravitational waves from a post-Newtonian expression. And I guess one could play the game of um, using a post-Newtonian expression to calculate how the orbital parameters would secularly change and then switch to a, so study it as a sequence of simulations, so to speak. So you can track the uh, orbital evolution in, in this way. Uh, so something can be done there, yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. very nice. Um, so I have one more question, uh, if I can. Um, um, so this is about, uh, remember uh, Gehard and others were working on the skeleton approximation where they actually solve the constraints and have the metric. Um, we assume uh, both uh, the extrinsic curvature and the three metric to be 
um, you know, uh, uh, there is no TT part on those. So in a way, it's similar to what you are doing in the sense of we are removing all the radiation parts from it. So I was wonder whether, you know, those are sort of analytically derivable under this approximation. So I, I would love to see whether, you know, the space time, what you are having is something similar to that. Uh, so. Yeah, what, what we have here is the uh, is the conformal thin sandwich uh, approximation. Correct, correct. So it's a yeah, it's a spectral solver, so it's not analytic, but it's uh, it's almost yeah. exact. No, no. So additional no. Uh, approximation what Gehad was put in was to assume you know you make the pi ij uh, you know the transfer stressless part to zero too. So it is not thin sandwich approximation, but it in a way it's close. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, anyway, we'll talk about it later. Thanks. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks. Great. We have a question from you. Oh, hi. Um, I, I want to ask uh, how it is possible to use your uh, uh, simulation of the image of the supermassive ball battery and with the, uh, the detection by a VLBI and recover the uh, information of the uh, disk uh, or uh, or other parameters? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, very, very complicated procedure, I would say. <laughs> you would um, you would generate the image with a ray tracing okay. code, uh, you assume okay. synchrotron emissivities and so on. And then once you have the image, then uh, you can you can produce the uh, visibility amplitudes or uh, complex visibilities or whatever you want that that you would see uh, with with a given array. And so it's it's, it's quite involved, but. Um, Oh, okay. I see. Thanks for your answering. Uh, cool. Uh, Roman, uh, any other questions before I take the liberty of asking one? Um, this seems to be the way in which to inform the imaging dynamic range requirement for the NGHT the best in terms of. Um, from the binary supermassive black hole perspective, would you would you agree, and will you be working toward that? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good point. Um, there's some restrictions on the orbit. We 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 have to have circular orbits, for example, but we can vary the mass ratio, spin. We can vary the state of the disk and things like that. And then if you attach it to the radiative transfer problem, then you would naturally take into account opacity effects and all these things, uh, uh, and get a good a good handle, I think, on on, on the dynamic range you need to, to see this. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Avery, uh, Hi, Roman. Of course, this is all uh, absolutely fantastic. But if, if, we, if we pull back just a little bit and uh, suppose we're not quite so fortunate as to, as to see merging black holes within the horizon uh, resolving uh, uh, region with NGHT, I mean, Certainly with a space mission, maybe we could do this. But um, even, even beyond that, one of the key drivers that I keep hearing is, is resolving binaries. So not necessarily seeing their horizons, but seeing the two binaries. And a key problem with that is going to be the, the flux ratio between them, right? So, so how much the secondary is accreting relative to the primary. So this really comes back to, I think what Roger just asked is the dynamic range question. Is, is this exactly the same question or? or, or if... it, is, it is certainly related. Um, and, and there are some conflicting uh, conclusions that people had in the, in the relativistic binary accretion community. Um, you can argue that the, that the secondary uh, has you know, less, less gravity and will be all things considered a little bit weaker. But on the other hand, you can be in the regime where the secondary um, receives mass accretion dominated by the primary. So it's kind of like overfed in some sense, right? And so uh, it's possible that for many, many ranges of parameter space, uh, the dynamic range isn't such a problem at all, but it, it needs to be looked into. Thank you. Cool. Interesting. All right. Um... Let's thank Roman again uh, for a great talk, some stimulating discussion, and we move on to our final talk, Achim Vidu uh, Gopakumar, um, 
talking about persistent multi-messenger gravitational wave astronomy during the NGHT era. Um, am I still muted or? I can hear you. And... Okay, sure. Uh, I'm going to put the presenter mode. Uh, can you see my slides? Great, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about a possible exercise that we may be able to uh, pursue uh, during the era of um, you know, uh, square kilometer array and NGEHT. This is the possibility of doing persistent multi-messenger nanohertz gravitational astronomy. The key idea is to monitor cosmological massive black hole binaries. So I'm actually talking it from the you know, perspective of a PTA, um, we are part of the uh, Pulsar Timing Array Networks. I am from uh, an institute in India, uh, Data Institute of Fundamental Research. Um, this is essentially something I presented in a telecon, so it's going to be something similar. Um, of course, um, uh, this community does not require any introduction to uh, multi-messenger gravitational astronomy. I'm fairly sure that you heard about um, GW170 or 817 and its electromagnetic counterparts. Um, so that's the uh, uh, event that inaugurated the era of uh, multi-messenger gravitational astronomy. Uh, this is despite the fact that the gravitational waves essentially lasted around 100 seconds and the source is essentially in the, in the backyard, 40 megaparsec. Um, but it has it created fundamental implication for physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. I'm not going to talk about any of those aspects. Um, but uh, uh, NGEHD is obviously is interested in massive black hole binaries. There are a bunch of other guys who are interested in that too. So this is the International Pulsar Timing Array Consortium, which is essentially a consortium of consortia. And, uh, uh, we essentially monitor a bunch of millisecond pulsars to look for this nanohertz gravitational waves simply because delta L over L is H. Similarly, delta T over T is also going to give you gravitational wave strain. And the IPTA uh, these days consists of the uh, nanograv consortium uh, that combines the North American observatories, and then the EPTA, uh, which has the European observatories. And uh, we are in India uh, uses the uh, amazing uh, upgraded GMRT. And then we have uh, the venerated Pax Observatory and the Australian Pulsar Timing Array. And in the coming years, both Meerkat and FAST will be joining. So this is going to be the NPT, IPTA uh, landscape in the coming years. And uh, the detection of gravitational waves are going to happen in the near future. Um, so, uh, so I'm just uh, listing uh, three papers which essentially talked about um, the possibility of actually seeing in their data sets a common, um, you know, spectrum process uh, that should be uh, s caused by. Uh, a stochastic gravitational wave background due to merging massive black hole binaries in the universe. So uh, that's going to be the first source uh, we will be detecting in the coming years. So it will be essentially a persistent diffuse background. And why do we expect um, so many uh, you know, merging black hole binaries so that it's actually going to give you a background. Um, so, um, that's uh, fairly easy to answer. However, um, after the discovery of uh, such a background, uh, there will be a uh, data release three from the consortia, and that is expected to lead to discoveries. And the question is that why do we expect um, uh, you know, a background? Is that we can actually estimate from a fairly similar uh, you know, back of the envelope arguments that uh, if there are galaxy mergers that happening, you know, in all the universe, at least 10 per year, and we are, and they involve uh, masses of the order of 10 raised to nine, we should be able to see, there should be at least 
you know, a billion such sources in a small frequency window of around uh, 10 raised to minus eight gig, uh, hertz in gravitational waves. And that's the reason why we are expecting the background. However, IPTA will be, um, um, especially during the square kilometer array era that will be in the, you know, uh, early 2030s, we should be expected to see continuous gravitational waves, not just the background. And then there will be burst, gravitational wave burst with memory and just the burst. So for example, burst with memory are associated with the black hole merger or hyperbolic passages. Um, and the continuous waves are actually from the inspiraling black hole binaries that uh, we heard in the last uh, three talks. So, and the PTS are uh, interesting experiment in the sense that we should be able to see the presence of gravitational waves, not at the position of Earth, but also in the position of the pulsar. And that's exciting. So we are looking for essentially slowly inspiraling massive black hole binaries, which is of clearly interest to this community too. And so there's a substantial overlap. So, and um, so, um, so when these binaries are, you know, before they are merger, that's the time we expect them to be relevant for NGEHD, and they can teach us quite a bit about the astrophysics. Um, so, and uh, interestingly, we also have a putative candidate for a nanohertz gravitational emitting massive black hole binary. And this is the uh, interesting and intriguing uh, blazer called OJ287. We have a model where we argue that this is, uh, uh, you know, contains a supermassive black hole binary, roughly 20 billion solar mass or being orbited by 150 million solar mass secondary in a 12 year orbital period. The way we argue that this binary black hole is essentially predicting certain impact flyers as shown in the cartoons and then using, um, you know, multi-wavelength observational campaigns uh, to look for these flyers and finding them. And this has, done, uh, this has been uh, practiced in the last 15 years, or so at least three times. But these days we are also looking into the position angle of OJ287 radio jet, as Neil was mentioning about, and trying to see whether we can you know, explain this, uh, the observed PA variations of OJ287 in the binary black hole scenario. This is an ongoing effort with Jose. We have actually clear prediction for the 86 gigahertz PA evolution. Um, if you remember, the PA is essentially the, the projection of the radio jet onto the plane of the sky. And so we actually, the, the, uh, these are essentially uh, G ongoing GMVA observation. And so the, the blue curve is the theoretical predictions. And um, uh, Jose was telling, and his colleagues are actually trying to see whether the predictions are consistent uh, with what they are seeing in the last few years, 17, 18, and 19. Hopefully, we will be able to monitor it in the coming uh, years to, you know, put an, another um, piece of evidence to suggest that it's possibly a supermassive black hole binary. Um, and of course, um, these days we are actually using uh, general relativistic techniques to model the expected pulsar timing array signals from such sources. So these are uh, massive black hole binary, they spin, so their curve parameter can vary. They can also have eccentricities and what you expect um, for you know, the deliverables of the PTAs. But interesting thing is that uh, many of the general relativistic quantities, what we use to construct these templates um, can be actually adapted for, um, you know, what uh, Roman was talking about. So hopefully uh, that should be interesting to the community too. Um, and again, um, if you can do all that, uh, what will be interesting is that we should be able to do this multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, that will be exciting um, uh, because the NG EHT can provide either candidates or monitor possible IPTA, you know, sources. And then, uh, uh, so that way we should be able to actually do cosmology and we can test general relativity. And these are the systems which emit neutrinos. So, you know, that can be another channel where we can look into 
Um, so this is the real multi-messenger and this is going to be persistent. It cannot be transient clearly. So that's it. Um, so, and uh, the exciting opportunity to, you know, have combined um, IPTA and NGST observation can actually do, for example, Hubble constant. Uh, it can be done, you know, purely from the nanohertz gravitational wave observation, purely from um, NGEST observation, or we can actually mix both the sectors. And that will be amazing to even calibrate, you know, each technique. So, and um, I hope that the post Newtonian um, uh, construct that we are developing can be adapted into uh, NGEST, you know, deliverables. And that's what I'm trying to learn and do. So, Thank you very much. I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Arjun Bidu. Um, and a virtual round of applause. Right, uh, questions. Uh, Roman, go for it. Thanks, Kobo. Great talk. Uh, Thank so, you. Yeah, one, one thing that, that comes to mind, and it, it's I guess also a question: What happens under the hood in your uh, in your prescription? If you have an expression for the binary, uh, especially if it's analytic, we 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 could plug it also in and, and do some of the other semi-analytic models. And I guess that's very close to what you're already doing, right? Um, um, what what does the model look like, and what is it in the data that you are fitting to? Is it do you really take the um, uh, complex visibilities or the visibility amplitudes and so on, and and do the model fitting there or or is there a layer in between? Yeah, as we heard from the first speaker, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, uh, they are developing it for the, you know, uh, the Newtonian prescription and should be fairly straightforward to put in the GR effects. That's one way. Uh, another possibility is to, um, you know, uh, do, for example, I mean, it may be too speculative, but um, 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 I was chatting with uh, Jose, and he was thinking about the astrometry. So uh, if you have closed uh, black hole binaries, then clearly the astrometry uh, deliverables can also be constructed using the post-Newtonian quantities. So, you know, so that should be one way of thinking about, you know, adapting those post-Newtonian um, constraints. Is that good enough or you are thinking about something else? Yeah, that's, that, that's good, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Avery. I go, folks. As, uh, firstly, a uh, wonderful talk, but also I've also <laughs> been stuck on this question you asked Roman. <laughs> so, so you have been doubly stimulating. And, and, sure. I, and I wanna ask you about that too. But, sure. but uh, we, when we're talking about astrometry, um, we wrote a paper uh, oh, just over 10 years ago, looking at a kind of the standard story of studying the cusp you know, the, the dark remnant cusp that's left behind um, when, when galactic centers are formed and, and evolved. And, and, and the, one of the ways you do that for uh, in our galaxy would be to watch uh, Sagittarius star jitter about. And, and I can't help but, but wonder if there is an interesting um, gravitational wave connection there because it is precisely that population of, of remnants of, of, of black holes and neutron stars that would form emeries uh, but these would, I mean, we'd be, we'd, ha we'd have to be incredibly fortunate to catch an emery. But, but then, but then these might be good PTA sources, um, and and we might be able to say something about, uh, you know, rates or uh, maybe the general noise in the PTA from stellar mass plus Sag A star binaries in the galactic core. They're not binaries anymore. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a many body system. Sure in comparison to the jitter that we see. Um, and, and that's all enabled by the astrometry. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm wondering if, if these, these sorts of incoherent, um, I mean, you talked about the noise from many, many binaries. It sounds like that's all very similar in flavor to the, the kind of calculation or the kind of problem that I'm imagining that it, it might just be a matter of, of scale. Yes, sure, it should be possible. Um, however, um, I think, uh, the gravity measurements can be sort of used to argue that, you know, um, uh, we don't have an intermediate mass black hole in the galactic center. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have something like that, then that should be clearly 
have a signature and we don't see that but the small jitter uh, as you correctly pointed out it can be from um, you know but um, I will be very surprised that uh, because this is a 10 raised to six solar mass black hole, um, if you want to have a, a, a perturbation, uh, you know, it has to be very close to the black hole. And then, um, you know, um, uh, I don't think uh, we expect so many such uh, emeries um, in our galactic center to begin with. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, actually you're dominated by um, the stuff a little bit further out. Ah, okay, just a kind okay. of Poisson noise in the net in the net ah, uh, sure. mass distribution, and 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 the reason why I say Sag A star is because Sag A star being only a million times more massive than all of them, because you're right, it is small. Right. Right. Uh, we'll be moving around with a typical typical scale of micro arc seconds, a few micro arc seconds, which you know, here we're talking about resolutions of ten, okay. but you can do astrometry far better than your nominal mm -hmm. resolution. Um, M eighty seven would be just completely impossible, right? A thousand times more massive. Sure. Um, you know, now we're talking about nano arc seconds. Right. So, so maybe this other question I'll, I'll ask you offline, but, but, but just, to, just to prime you is, uh, you asked Roman, uh, did you include gravitational radiation in the, in the uh, images? And, and it isn't totally obvious to me that it's not relevant. And, and that, would be, that would be something, you know, maybe to think about uh, offline, how, how could gravitate, because it's of course much stronger near the binary and even small deflections in the path of the photons to us can show up in their interferometric signals. So, so I'm wondering if there is a clean test that would, that would be sensitive to gravitational radiation from the binary. Oh, now you're thinking about uh, uh, the photon interacting with the strong field, you know, near sun gravitational waves. I, I was yeah. not thinking about that. I mean, that will be an exciting thing. Um, you know, um, so we don't do that, right? I mean, so what you are talking about is some sort of a, um, uh, you know, Shapiro effect of, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. oh, that will be, uh, I haven't even thought about it as such. That's kind of evil, I mean, I will argue. It is, so. and, and, and it's, it's coherent. As long as as long as C is C, right? As long as everything moves at the speed of light, so sure. so that will be um, anyway. Anyway, okay. Make yeah, more thank offline. you. Uh, that's an interesting thing too. But the problem is that you know defining gravitational wave in the near sun is a pain in the neck from a Poissonian perspective. And uh, uh, only we have these numerical GR people floating around. Sure. You could tell oh us. yeah, sure, sure. The wrong one. <laughs> definitely one of them. Yes, thank well, you. You've certainly yeah. created food for thought. Oh, no. oh, definitely. Um, yes. Thanks. Great. Well, uh, we're, we're spot on time. Um, thanks to, um, unfortunately, one of our speakers didn't show up, but it means we're on, on time and we've had some stimulating discussions. So thank you, Gopak, and thank you all the speakers of this breakout session. And um, yeah, sign off and go back to the main room.